we've got time for some questions. If we can't get through all of the questions, um, they will be, we'll, we've got some follow-up resources that will be available and we'll cover any that don't get answered now in that. Um, but we will go to our panel and I've got some questions here and I will maybe suggest who'd like to first answer the question. And then if anybody else from the panel wants to follow up with an answer, then do feel free to do so. So thinking about just following on from a bit about this whole starting up um, family hubs, there's a question here though, and I guess actually Rachel, perhaps I can start with you on this. Um, what should I do if my church doesn't want to have new programs? Gosh, um, I guess my question would be, are you the leader in that church and your church don't want to do it? Or are you the, the kind of the champion in your church who's desperate to do it and your leaders aren't interested? Um, because my my response might be slightly different depending on who you you know kind of where you are in that um, I think um, listening to each other I know I said I talked about listening to um, our, our community and our local authority but actually as church listening to each other why um, why is there reluctance why is there reticence is it because there's fatigue and exhaustion um, and sometimes I think we need to be brave and start something, however small that is, and show what's possible. So I guess my answer would be different depending on where you are in terms of the um, the church structure on that yeah. one. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. That, that makes sense. Anybody else want to just yeah. jump in on that one? Or we're not going to get into church politics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another question um, concerning really the same thing about family hubs how many of you um and in the churches that you work with are using your own church buildings and how many of you have taken on new spaces who'd like to go first so, well, uh, just if i jump in there it's a mix almost 50 50 um uh uh we've seen it if it really depends on the building if you've got one big hall and it's you know wooden boards and it's not you know and it's a bit cold and so on that's not going to be appropriate um, and there are a lot of local authorities who are looking at how, how to use their children's centres. And, you know, you've got a custom built centre there and we're seeing that happen as well. Um, and it also depends on the locality of your church. You know, if you, you know, you might be in a, in a great place location wise in a church, but the community you want to serve might be across the road. Uh, it's often best to go and find them. So we, we've seen a mix. OK, thank you. Anybody else? I was just thinking um, what Rachel um, was saying about, you know, the space we have often, we have, if we have churches, we have space, which we use intensely on a Sunday, but we've got all this space. And I do think, you know, not every building, obviously all of what Ian says is completely true, but also it's like, if you do have some space, then that's a gift actually. And, you know, otherwise it, it's just kind of sitting there. Um, and so let's if we're generous with space and we, if we then then we're helping and as soon as we're helping then we begin having conversations don't we and we're, we're more you know we're more we're trying to bless people really i mentioned something about space in the chat earlier um which has been a really sort of valuable resource i think that we will we're sharing a lot more because of these relationships we've formed so um during the pandemic um, one of the issues locally was Families just being stuck at home in really overcrowded conditions sometimes, not able to take their children to school because schools weren't open. But so, so one of the partners just made their space, which previously was kind of a family space, available to individual families so they could just go and have a bit of bit of time and, and to themselves in a, in a nice environment. Um, and then more generally, I think we've, outside of the pandemic, that that sort of need for parents just to find ways to get together in particularly in communities where people are coming and going quite a bit, where people are quite mobile the sort of thing you get at the school gates when your children start school and you've got this kind of new community of parents that are in similar situations to yourself but if you can do that earlier with families just by making space available to them that i think that's a good way in um and, and a resource that, that everyone's got in slightly different ways okay thank you steve and, and actually steve while you're there <laughs> um a couple of questions about working with local authorities i think which is a, which is a big thing for churches in particular they're new new to it and not really knowing where to start. So what are some good routes into conversations with local councils if you're struggling? Um, I think as I, as I mentioned earlier, the Supporting Families programme. So that's being sort of revamped a bit at the moment. Um, there's a question mark about what's gonna happen in the future with it, subject to the spending review. But um, 
but that that's being sort of developed as kind of a whole system approach to providing help um, and every local authority is thinking about that and that, how they're going to take that forward um, each local authority has got someone like me who's got that role to coordinate it um, within reason I might be able to tell people who who to contact certainly in London um, for, for some of some of those programs the other thing I didn't say as well was that local safeguarding children's partnerships as well who are really keen to kind of engage with faith communities um, and obviously churches are a good vehicle for doing that they they provide certainly provide training and they might have parts of their safeguarding plan which 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 are around that it's probably sort of slightly higher level than the kind of early intervention we're talking about but there, there will be people there who are wanting to develop that way of working um, and yeah covid recovery as i said before it's everyone's thinking what are we going to do now now things are starting to settle down a bit with particularly with families that we haven't worked with before who are suddenly in situations where they haven't needed support in the past but now they do it could be that your organizations are the, the ones that know these people and the ones that they trust and all local authorities are developing covid recovery strategies so we'd we'll be looking for partners around that okay thank you steve um, and the, there's another question, and it's the other side of the coin in a bit, although it still impacts for you, Steve, but perhaps um, with some of the others, with maybe Rachel or Ian or Avril, um, or Jenny even, how do, you, how do you move from being referred to from the statutory sector through to having contracts with the statutory sector? How do you do that big jump to being seen as a contract provider rather than just somebody to be referred to? Avril, you're nodding. Yeah, I mean, that, that can often be quite an interesting um, opportunity, really. I think I think what we've done and also what I say to others locally even today is there is a place that when you find you're getting referrals and no one is paying for that, if you have funding for that, then wonderful. But there is a point at which you can say, do you know what, nobody's paying for this. So how do we start to have the conversation about who's going to pay for this? Because I do think it's actually quite an important thing. Now, there are times, to be honest, because it's just part of our mission that we do things anyway, but that's a decision. But it has to be a decision because otherwise there are other bits. That, so you, I would start to have a conversation with the people who are making the referrals, not saying, hey, you must pay me, but kind of saying, you know, we are finding this many people come through our doors. I think what Jenny was saying in is, well, be careful, make sure you have evidence of the impact you are having on those families. And then have a grown up conversation with the people who are making referrals and saying, what are we going to do about this? And how might we fund it? And they may say, well, we've got no money, which I understand completely. But then you say, well, then can we look together at where this funding can come from? Because sometimes through a, a partnership with a local authority and a, and a, a charity or a church, you can actually go to a funder to prove the need that you already have. But it's a, it's a, it's, it's one of these conversations, a bit like Jenny said, you have to keep having and keep chipping away and be careful you don't just do things free because you think you should. There is, but it's fine to do things free as long as you know the value of it. Lovely, thank you, Avril. Well, can, I, can I jump in on that? Oh, Ian, okay? yes. And then maybe Rachel after you, Ian. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, the first thing I'd say is um, when you're providing a service for free, um, uh, it's your own house. You can do what you like. The rules are yours. The moment someone is paying for it, there is a big, big step up. That is a serious, we need to think hard about that moment. Um, but let's just say you want to do the step up. What will it mean? Um, it will mean you've got to be consistent. You've got to show outcomes. No one gives away money and hope it works out. They're going to want to know what happened with that money. How did you spend it? So we give, for example, if we get you know, a grant for 10 grand from a local authority, we'll get, um, you know, we'll have to count it for 50 pounds by 50 pounds by 50 pounds. And we'll also have to show the outcomes. Where did they start? Where did they finish? Um, and that is a bit, you know, when, before you move that step, you know, that's, that's a big one to do. Let's just say you want to make, make that step where we look. Well, um, everybody's going to laugh when I say this out loud, but actually early help and your local CCGs have more money than often they'll fess up to. And early help will often run annual um, uh, grants and um, uh, uh, funding bids. They're quite small, normally up to about five, maybe 10,000 pounds. But as everything Avril then said is absolutely bang on the money. You've got to show you evidence. You won't get any money unless you do. And you've got to be able to prove that you better deliver that service consistently because they depend on you. Um, CCGs uh, as well. How do you meet? How do you find out about this? 
Well, sometimes you have to go and find out who your local councillor is and they will know and they will tell you who that person is. But before you do that, you know, it's a, it's a deep breath moment because that is a big, that's a big transition. Mm, lovely, Ian, thank you. And Rachel, over to you, I think last comment now before we bring our webinar Sorry. to Yeah. Um, so firstly, I would say volunteering doesn't equal free. I think we need to acknowledge that, you know, that these things that, you know, there's, there's a cost, um, whether a monetary cost or a time cost, but there is a cost. Um, and so, you know, don't forget the value of that. Um, partnership doesn't always need to mean money is the other thing. Um, we can be in partnership because we're connecting together and we're learning together. Um, and I think for us, the way that we we first kind of like, got into our journey but ended up in our first service level agreement was because we were doing some voluntary work in a, a very loose kind of connection with somebody in the council who then put us in touch with somebody else who put us in touch with somebody else so you just never know where those connections might come from but when you're doing what you're good at and um and that's noticed and you're in those connections then you know anything can happen and you know god does crazy things Lovely, thank you, thank you so much. Well, we are drawing to a close now, final minutes of our time together. First of all, a, a big thank you to everybody who's joined us online for this webinar. Um, if you've got any more questions, just send them through. So I'll, I'll put Catherine on the spot, send them through to the Family Hubs Network, um, or you can contact us here at Care for the Family as well, if we can help you in any way at all. Uh, there will be more resources going out to you. Thank you, especially to all of our guest speakers today. Thank you so much for giving up your time giving us your wisdom, your enthusiasm, your energy, your insightfulness. That has been so helpful. And, and I've certainly learned a lot today. And also thank you to the Family Hubs Network because they've been banging on about this to government for quite a long time now. And it's lovely to see finally policy has actually woken up to the beauty that can be found within Family Hubs Network and working collaboratively with all agencies together. So thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day and do keep in touch with us. Goodbye. <laughs>